What does it mean to live a resilient life? I'm Ryan Mannion. I lost my brother to war and my mom to cancer, and I've learned a lot about myself along the way. Now, as the CEO of Travis Mannion Foundation, I'm on a journey to explore what it means to be resilient against life's many challenges. Join me and some incredible guests as we ask ourselves the hard questions and define what it means to struggle well. All right. Well, welcome to another episode of the Resilient Life Podcast. I've been waiting for a long time to bring this guest on. Uh, Tulsi Gabbard, welcome to the Resilient Life. Thank you, Ryan. I have been uh, such an incredible fan of you and your work and how you continue to honor your brother by honoring so many people and creating this 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 amazing community uh, and family support system for each other. So I, I just want to sincerely thank you for all the work that you do and how you are finding your way to serve. Thank you. And, you know, I, I feel so many synergies with you. Um, of course, I know so much about you, but I was doing my research and reading your bio because I was trying, I, I wasn't sure kind of how you got into um, elected office and what your path was that took you there. And, you know, you were 21 years old when you went and joined the state legislator, which is incredible. When you think about, I think of a lot of 21 year olds that I know right now, and um, that's not certainly something that's on their mind, but um, more importantly, your decision to um, become a Congresswoman really stemmed from your time in Iraq and coming back and you said, you know, you experienced firsthand the cost of war and you ran at age 31 vowing to pay homage to the lives that were lost. And um, I'd love to talk a little bit more about that because my family kind of went through a very similar pathway, but I'd love to just learn why you felt it was so important. Obviously, you know, you, you go over to Iraq, you're losing your brothers and sisters in arms, but what was the decision that when I come back, I'm going to run for office and that's going to be where I make my mark and, and, um, and honor those lives lost. Yeah. You know, it wasn't, um, it wasn't a very linear decision at all. You know, when I ran for state house in Hawaii, I was 21 years old. I didn't have a bachelor's degree at the time. I didn't have the things that that people think, well, I've got to check all these boxes before I can run for any office. And I, I'm grateful. I have a lot of veterans who contact me, just some I know, most who are cold calling me uh, and just asking for advice because they want to continue to serve in some way in public service after they lay down the uniform. But usually there's this, this concept of a prerequisite, uh, whether it's to run for state house or assembly or for Congress or any other office. And it's just not true. Um, I never thought at that time, like, okay, well, this is going to be my first step in a long political career and I'll go here and then go there and then go there. It was really just driven out of a desire to serve my community and a recognition that we had politicians in Hawaii who were um, kind of seeing the job as more of like a kick your feet on the desk retirement post retirement gig than actually like getting their hands dirty going out in the community and and really identifying what what are the real problems that need to be solved rather than just waiting for people to to knock on the door or call them and ask for help and so i i served for one term i was campaigning for re-election our uh, hawaii army national guard brigade combat team was activated for a deployment to iraq uh long story short i was not on the deployment roster I was in a medical unit at the time, a headquarters medical unit. They had pulled someone else to fill the to fill the slot that I would have filled, and my commander called and said, "Hey, good, you know, uh, good news. You don't have to go." Um, I I just knew very quickly there was no way I was going to stay home. Yeah. And so I withdrew from that reelection campaign, volunteered to deploy, got retrained in a job that they needed filling, and uh, went and during that year long deployment to Iraq in two thousand five as you mentioned, uh, saw and experienced the reality and the harshness and the ugliness of war in all of its elements. And so coming back from that, a lot of my friends at home here in Hawaii, uh, you know, they just assumed the natural thing would be to go back, run for my old seat again, kind of pick life up where I had left it. 
And I, I just couldn't do it. I couldn't do it. It didn't, I felt a sense of duty and responsibility to take those experiences that I had had, uh, the things that I had learned and try in some way, shape or form to use them to positively impact um, the problems that I saw to try to help work towards finding a solution. So it wasn't an immediate like, okay, I'm gonna come back and run for Congress. I really didn't know the answer to where and how I could best do that. And uh, so I came back in 2006 from that deployment, ended up being uh, um, having the opportunity to work as a legislative aide for one of Hawaii's US senators who was the chair of the Veterans Affairs Committee at the time. And so went to Washington for a couple of years and was able to take those experiences and, and apply them to support his work in a way that what well, he's a World War II veteran. Um, the experience of Vietnam veterans, World War II veterans, Korean War veterans is very different from our experience as post 9-11 generation veterans. So, so long story short, uh, my journey has been one of a constant state of self-reflection of how can I best be of service? How can I best make that most positive impact? And so while I came home from that first deployment in 2006, um, I didn't run for Congress until 2012. But all of those things, everything that happened over that uh, that period of time, including a second deployment to the Middle East, uh, are what ultimately drove me both to run for Congress and to run for president because of politicians who are out of touch, who don't really care, who are making these decisions uh, that, that directly impact my brothers and sisters in uniform and wanting to do something to honor them. Yeah, you know, when my brother was killed in 2007, you know, there was a couple things that happened um, that kind of showed me how heavily politics plays into things like war. Yeah. And it was something that I was largely unaware of, um, you know, during his time in service. You know, my dad's a retired colonel in the Marine Corps. And, you know, I was a military kid. I bounced around from military base to military base when I was young. My mom was a classic military spouse, you know, moved where we went, took care of the family. And for me, it was largely just this sense of patriotism and duty to country that I watched and witnessed my dad and my brother. But I'll never forget when my brother was killed, there was a civic building in our town and I won't share what civic building it was, but they would change the number. And I noticed it before he left for Iraq, but every time a service member was killed, and this is at the height of the surge. And so, you know, there's men and women dying every single day and they would have a lives lost. And it was just a number that changed. And I'll never forget. It was a couple of days after his funeral, I'm driving through town and I saw that the number had changed and, and that number reflected my brother. And, you know, I'm in a, the beginning stages of heavy grief. And I barged into the building and, you know, I used some choice words to say that my brother is not just another number. Um, I feel bad for the lady that I berated behind that desk because I know that wasn't the decision that she made, but it was kind of that moment where I felt, oh my gosh, you have to step into the arena to make a difference. And these decisions that are being made for these young men and women are being made far off in a, you know, in a boardroom that has nothing to do with these families that are suffering the loss. And, you know, my dad ended up running for Congress in 2008 and he ran against Patrick Murphy, who was at the time, the only Iraq war veteran in Congress. Mm -hmm. And so it was really a referendum on the Iraq war because you had this gold star father, retired Marine Corps colonel and and Patrick Murphy. And um, and I've shared this story many times. So my dad ended up losing. He got more votes than any um, challenger in the state of Pennsylvania, but did not win. Obama won the election that year. He was a Republican. It, you know, it wasn't things were not in his Tough favor. Political year. Tough political year. But because of that, I ended up running the following year for our township supervisor. And I wanted to play a decision. I wanted to make decisions, like you said, like how could I make decisions that helped the community and at large and starting from the ground up. And I ran 
I got elected and I served 12 years. I actually just resigned um, after my second term in December. But that taught me so much about how important it is to get involved. And, you know, for me, it was it was everything. And those last 12 years and, you know, which brings you to the fact, you know, you have a new book coming out um, for love of country. And it's about people over party, right? Yes. And full circle, when I ran for my second, when I ran for re-election, it was, again, a, another tough year. I live in Bucks County. It is, if you you are involved in presidential elections, you know Bucks County. We are a decision maker. And Bucks County is not Trump country. Um, there's It's a 50-50 split, but it's not Trump Republicans here. And so when I ran for re-election, people just wanted to know if I voted for Trump. And I said, well, how about wow. I tell you about what I did for the last six years? Was it a nonpartisan race? Um, no. Or did you have to pick a party? Okay. Oh, yeah, I had to pick a party. I ran as a Republican. Okay. Yeah, okay. so I ran as a Republican. And um, and my opponent just tied me to Trump. You know, I, I had no affiliation with Trump, but I was I was a Republican. I was Trump. And yeah. so um, I went back to Patrick Murphy and Patrick Murphy is a well-known, you know, he was a congressman. He was undersecretary of the army and he became a good friend after him and my dad ran. And I said to Patrick, you know, I've worked so hard these last six years and I'm just getting trounced because I'm being tied to a president that that plays no plays no fact in what I've been doing here for six years. And he said, well, I'm going to come out and endorse you. And he did a mailer for me to all of the residents of Doylestown Township. He got blasted by the Democratic Party here in Bucks County. And I said, I feel really bad, Patrick, that you put your neck out for me. And he said those exact words to me. He said, Ryan, I'm people over party every day. I won that election by six votes. Six wow. votes. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. That's such and a great illustration of so many things, but but right there, um, you know, I, I hear unfortunately from people all the time who are just like, I'm so frustrated, I feel hopeless, my voice doesn't matter, my vote won't make a difference, the whole system is rigged. You go on and on and on. I'm sure you've heard this yeah. over and over yourself. But that right there is such a great example of those six people, those six people ultimately deciding the election. And, and that's really what is at the, the core of my book for love of country. It is a reminder to every one of us as Americans, regardless of your political affiliation. Obviously, in the book, I go through my journey of being a Democrat for over 20 years and the reasons chapter by chapter why I left the Democratic Party and became an independent. But it all comes down to this. If you are frustrated, if you are angry, if you are dissatisfied, with the leadership that we have, that our founders were, were incredibly wise in their vision that they had, that they laid down in those founding documents. It's up to us to make a difference. There's no one single person, the you know, knight in shining armor who's gonna come in and save us. We make the decisions about who we want to serve the people, whether it be in your local township or board of education or a city council, mayor, Congress, president, every position that we have, we have this opportunity every year, every two years, whatever the cadence of the election is to make that decision. And we can sit back and say, oh, well, I'm just gonna vote down party line. But, but it's such a, um, it, it really is a disservice to those who have sacrificed so much to defend our freedom to so easily throw away our own responsibility to do our part in defending our freedom right here at home, uh, which is which is necessary. You know, we say freedom isn't free. It's true, and there are so many different costs that go towards we as a free people exer be, having having the right to exercise our freedom and the actions that we can take to defend it. And it's not just something that happens at the federal level, far away in Washington. DC, I think over the last, you know, since since COVID started, I think people are seeing more and more. Oh my gosh, the local council, the local board of health, the local mayor, they can actually make these rules that are directly impacting your children, your family, your freedom here in Hawaii, your ability to go to the beach, go surfing, go swimming. I mean, it I think things got very real and and that's why 
I wrote this book. I hope in this election year, people take some time to reflect uh, for themselves, for ourselves, as you did when you decided to run is, is how can I be a part? How can I be a part of the solution? Yeah. And that's really, you know, I will tell you, I, I was in my 20s when I ran. I I don't know. I was thinking of what can I do? And I don't know that I fully understood how much of an impact you can make at a local level. Yes. And the decisions that were being made here in my town of 20,000 that had far more impact on these residents than anything happening in D.C., Yes. And, you know, I walk away from that with such a greater understanding of, again, that need to, you know, get involved. And yeah. I would say that every day to the people that would walk in and want to get behind the soapbox and just bark and bark and bark. And I'd say, we got a lot of committees on here. Why don't you come and join us? You know, exactly. so there's just so many opportunities. And, you know, one of the things I also was thinking, you know, when you ran for president, I was such a huge fan. Um, such a huge fan. And it was the first time, you know, I, I, I was born into a Republican household that, you know, it, that was what I was raised with. I became a Republican. I'm, I'm unabashed in saying that, but I am someone that I never voted party lines. I yeah. never will. And I never did. And, and my family taught me that as well. You know, it was like, well, we believe in conservative values, but we don't just push a button and vote town ticket. That's not what we do. We understand the people that we're voting for. Cause guess what? There's really crappy Republicans too. And yeah. I've, I've come across a lot of them. So, yes. and, um, but just, just what you said, just what you said, um, it's people before party. Right. Period. Yeah. I mean, if that's the guiding principle, if that's the guiding, um, light for people as we go and make these decisions as we get educated why primary or why primary elections are just as important as general elections because we we have that responsibility to choose not just the party but actually which candidate is committed to the constitution and and committed to putting the interests of the people ahead of party or self or anything else yeah, and I think one of the things that I've noticed that as a society, we've gotten so far away from that. Like, I don't think we could be further away from that. And, you know, I think a lot about how we overcome the polarization that is just taking over our country right now. And I went back because I was curious, and I didn't know the answer to this, how many of our presidents were not veterans. And, you know, out of the 46, there were only 14 presidents that have not served their country. And wow, I didn't yeah, know that. yeah, so 31 have served in served the served the military in in, in one way or another. Um, the last president that we had that served in the military was was George Bush. Um, the most decorated president was his father, actually, um, military decorated. Um, but. I started to think about, because I think about the work that we do at the Travis Manning Foundation, and it's all about making sure that we are putting veterans front and center for our next generation. We are getting them out into communities. And I thought, I almost believe that it should be a prerequisite because of where we are today with everything happening with national security and our national defense. I feel that it should be a prerequisite that you have to serve Along with being 35 and a U.S. citizen, you should have to serve in the military to run for president. And I, I believe that could be a difference maker for how we move forward as a society. I'm curious to hear your thoughts on that. Yeah, I, I, I disagree with the prerequisite requirement solely because when you look at the prerequisites that are laid out in the Constitution is, you know, you're born a U.S. citizen and you're 35 years old. That's it. That's the prerequisite. And, and the reason why, um, and, and I want to get into this a little bit, but, but the, when we look at the Constitution, the Bill of Rights, for example, uh, it, it lays out the very, very limited role that government should play to ensure our liberty as citizens in this country, to be able to decide things for ourselves to the, to the utmost extent possible. Yeah. So we have these limited guardrails that are put forward, uh, that are put forth in our founding documents. Um, 
I think that it's incredibly valuable and important for voters to look at, well, what experience do you bring to the table? You're asking for my trust and my vote to give you that honor and responsibility of serving as pre president and commander in chief. The onus is put on us to be able to uh, decipher those characteristics that we want. I agree. I think that having that experience, uh, I can speak firsthand, it has exposed me to and taught me so much in a deeply visceral and personal way that has informed my foreign policy and the kind of work that I've done um, uh, on different policies, whether it's in office or, or even out of office. My advocacy for leaders who are uh, who, who must be more thoughtful and careful before deciding to go and start a war or topple a dictator or send our troops to one place or another place without clearly thinking through some basic things like what are we trying to accomplish? Does it serve the best interests of the United States and the American people? Will this be counterproductive and actually undermine our national security? What does winning look like? How do you define this? When do you know when it's time to exit? Do you have a plan for that? All of these things are, are, are um, basic concepts. Uh, and yet so many of our political leaders, they don't ask themselves this question, uh, nor are they able to answer them when, when asked. Um, you know, it, it's, it's, I'm, I'm thinking through some diplomatic ways to say this. I have worked with other people in politics who have worn the uniform Mm -hmm. And I'm grateful to them, as I am to all veterans who volunteer to serve. Um, however, they have, in some cases, lacked this kind of care and thoughtfulness in how they approached and advanced their own foreign policy. Yeah. Um, some who just say, oh, we should just go bomb the shit out of the bad guys. Yeah. I, I get that kind of talk maybe as you're sitting in the team room, but if you're in a position of great power, where you are directly making decisions about what the repercussions of that kind of action would be, you've got a lot more responsibility to really think through what does that mean? And, and so this exchange I had with another member of Congress who was a veteran happened uh, on live TV. And I think my response to him was like, well, tell me exactly who are the bad guys? How are they going to respond? Right. Uh, and, and it was just it, it was it was a little example that that showed me just like, wow, OK, this guy has also served our country in uniform. And yet he appears to have the lack of depth in understanding the process we need as American service members, veterans, military families, the process we need our leaders to go through before making that decision. We all volunteer to serve, knowing that at some point we may be called to put our lives on the line, our leaders. And that's. That's a that's a free choice made out of free will. Right. Our leader's responsibility is to make sure that that decision is made with great care, understanding the massive, immeasurable cost that those individuals and their families are making, and that it is only as a last resort to serve the safety, security, and freedom interests of the American people and our country. So all of that is to say, you know, just like just like we need politicians to put country before party, um, whether one has served or one hasn't served, we as voters have to do our job to hold them accountable uh, to their approach and to the decisions that they're making. Yeah, I think it's a good point. And, you know, I think I find myself now in a position where, again, you know, I was very jaded at uh, our government um, after my brother was killed um, because I remember the conversations that I had with my brother, that my dad had with my brother. And, you know, my dad or my brother would constantly say things like people have no idea what's happening over here. They just and I'm sure you saw it, too. You know, and he was part of a MIT team. He was training the Iraqi army right. and he felt such a kinship with the Iraqis that he was training. I mean, so much so that we, we've had some of them here at our house and have broke bread with them here in Pennsylvania because they ended up getting visas and coming over here. And and um, the, the Iraqis held a memorial service for Travis um, after he was killed. And I remember his commanding officer said, you know, in all my time here, I've never seen the Iraqis hold a memorial service for a, an American service member. And so, you know, 
I think about it from that perspective, right? But then I also think about it from the perspective, I've got a daughter that's going to the Naval Academy next year. So on June 27th, she's going to raise her right hand. And all of a sudden now I'm a, I'm a military mom. And I was so, I'm so proud of her and I'm so excited for her, her path forward, but it scares me. I'm not going to lie. It scares me to think about decisions that can be made by career politicians that make some of those decisions, like you say, without enough depth and thought. And, you know, I I try to think about what can we do outside of, you know, we talk about getting involved, moving the needle, stepping into the arena, but like, what can we do? Like, what can the everyday American do to help stop some of the polarization that's happening in our country right now? Like, what advice could you give to the person listening that says like, what role can I play? I'm not going to run for office. That's not sure. something I can do. But what can I do right now? It, I think a lot of people, and this is this is the question. Yeah. This is the question, really. Um, a lot of people underestimate their um, sphere of influence. You think like, oh, maybe I'm just a mom or I'm just a teacher. I'm just a this, just a that. And I hate it when people say that because... Um, they really do underestimate their power and their influence to be the change, to be a part of the solution, to step into the arena, as you say. The the way the arena is defined is different for every one of us because we're unique as people. Uh, our experience is unique, our background is unique. But but let's say you're a mom raising your kids at home. Uh, look at look look at your phone. Scroll down your phone and see all of the names that are in your phone. Those are people that you know personally to one degree or another. And you have a bill, you have an ability to impact. You think about, you know, maybe the other moms in, in the neighborhood who you see at the, the park every day with your kids, or uh, you know, maybe it's a, a parent teacher association, whatever that is, you have an ability to impact impact and influence those people. Uh, and it really just starts with what we in Hawaii call aloha, yeah. which means respect. It means love, it means compassion, it's a recognition that um and and it's the reason why we use it to greet people when we greet people with aloha it's a recognition that we are all children of god we are um you know that eternal spirit that 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 is inside of every one of us and so we can see past oh you're a democrat or republican you know you're a trump supporter you're a biden supporter um you know this you're black you're white you're hispanic like your religion christian hindu muslim all of these different labels that are unfortunately so often used in this polarized time to tear us apart and put us in these little boxes. Every single one of us has the ability and the opportunity to start to change that, to instead of easily um, casting someone with a broad brush judgment because of they are this, fill in the blank. Instead, maybe reach out and have a conversation that you wouldn't have had before and just say, hey, how's it going? How are you? What are you up to? What is, you know, what's on your mind? What do you care about? And that that really is how we begin to uh, uh, how we begin to come together, because ultimately, whatever your political differences may be or your other other um, things that tend to segment us into these different categories in society. At, at our core, we are Americans. Right. We we live in this the, this country that remains the greatest country in the world, even with our flaws and challenges. And our freedom is really what makes this country so great. Our freedom is what is under attack right now. And so when, when people, you know, um, I, I often remind people as I'm going around and, and speaking at different events and talking with different groups of people, it's OK to disagree with someone. Yeah, It's okay to be friends with someone who you disagree with. When you look back to our founding fathers, they had fierce disagreements about a lot of different things, but they came together around these fundamental principles of freedom that are enshrined in our constitution, our God-given and alienable rights, and that those are the things that we have to be able to come together around so that we can have this open marketplace of ideas, so we can have the freedom to worship as we choose or not at all, so that we can have the the ability to choose for for you as a mom, as parents, how to raise your kids, what kind of education you want to give them, what kind of opportunity you are seeking to present 
for them and their future. All of these things come down to us as Americans being able to come together around those fundamental principles and treating each other with respect. And I largely think that the vast majority of Americans fully believe that. Mm -hmm. And they fall into this group, you know, when you when you think about it, you think about I always think about it. I look at it this way. I think about my kids. and I've got three kids. My kids don't pick their friends based off their political affiliations, right. their religious backgrounds or their socioeconomic makeup. My kids pick their friends because they find people that they can have fun with and do things yes. they, they have, you know, and and they find common ground in uh, being happy with each other. And and I also, you know, of course, when we're adults and we start to have all of these other noises in our head, I look at our military service members. And if you look at our our military, it's perhaps the greatest social experience uh, experiment of diversity and diverse backgrounds coming together for a common goal right and yes. and i feel like if we could get behind and again the military does not come without its flaws as well as every group has but if you look at the social experiment that is our military where everybody is free to join um but you must all understand the principles for which you stand for, right? And we stand for as an organization and you're never going to fully agree with every decision, but at the end of the day, you're all going to disagree and commit, I guess is the best way to say it, yeah. right? And and come together. And so I think about, you know, and that's one of the things that we largely focus on, like when our service members take off the uniform, all of those things are intangible skill sets that they have learned that our civilian counterparts haven't. And we need to make sure that they are not taking all of that and it's just, it just lies with them. And so that's why for us, we are always saying like, you've taken off the uniform, but we need to put you put you in a different uniform. And yeah. the uniform is how you serve your communities, you know? Exactly. And, and that may be through a nonprofit. It may be through a business. It may be through education. It may be through tech. There, there's, there's, um, I think all the the misconceptions and like preconceptions of what people think service is, um, is often, you know, you are either a firefighter, or you serve in the military, or you're a first responder. Uh, but really, what what it means to serve is to dedicate your skills and your talents and and your experience in service to others to make that positive impact. And I've seen how in, in um. Uh, I think someone was telling me about how in Israel, uh, military service is seen as like the the industry, you know, different industries and different sectors. They've headhunters. They're always trying to recruit the best and top talent. They really place that military leadership experience at the top of that list because they understand um, how it's so easily transferable and applicable to every other part of our society and. And I, I, that's, I love and appreciate what you're doing because to me, that's the shift that we need to see take place here in our own country is instead of seeing veterans as victims or somehow people who are, um, I don't know, handicapped, I suppose, in right. some fashion and deserving of their foursome charity, but looked at with like, oh, kind of a poor you. Yes, we thank you for your service, but poor you. Uh, that this experience that you're talking about, these intangibles, these qualities and characteristics that so many of our veterans have because of that decision that they made to serve, make them the greatest asset to all of these different kinds of organization. And my hope is that we have business leaders, community leaders, um, neighbors, friends, residents, schools who really start to recognize that as more and more of our generation of veterans are stepping out of uniform and trying to figure out how do I find this um, purpose that right. is rooted in service in this next phase of life. And I think, you know, we have found, we we base a lot of the work we do off a Pew study that, that came out a few years ago that said, you know, 55% of veterans that take off the uniform cite that they feel disconnected yeah. From the communities in which they return to. And so for us, it was this kind of simple science of 
okay, well, let's make sure they don't feel disconnected. And how do you not feel disconnected? Will you give community back to them? And so, you know, the Travis Manning Foundation does a lot of things, but at the end of the day, we say we are a large community. We're a community where you can come to find that continued purpose. Um, and and I think, you know, there's this, there's this middle ground that we have to come. I think we've come a long way. I remember being at a conference several years ago and speaking about why it's so important to recruit military talent into the civilian sector. And, and one of the CEOs raised his hand and said something like, well, I, I just don't want to deal with veterans and like the PTSD thing. And, you know, there was a lot of eye pulling and we had to explain some some that the vast majority of veterans are sitting in a place where they're thriving and ready to go. Um, but you also don't want to forget that there is a epidemic happening right now with our veteran population that is extreme with, you know, suicidal ideation. And, you know, as we make sure we're highlighting that veterans are civic assets, I, I don't want to forget the fact that we have to make sure that we are being proactive. And I don't think anybody, I think there's a lot of, I think there's a lot of solution based approaches for veterans when they were in that crisis um, and they are at that final stage, but nobody is focusing on how to prevent them from getting there. And, you know, we talk a lot about the VA really starting to adopt these holistic approaches because you see it, you're at events with veterans a lot. You see what bringing veterans together and bringing that community together, that's that's really, at a lot of times, that's all it takes. I see it every day. But it's it's like they can't conceptualize that just bringing people together with a common purpose is going to help. And it's frustrating. It's, it's frustrating for us to see that we can't adopt just simple ideas um, to, to show how we can kind of stop veterans from getting to that that place of isolation what what you're talking about is right if 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 as a society and the va those who, those who are in a position to best help people are are uh seeing that their task is to say well hey here's a number you can call 24 7 to reach out if you reach or when you reach that point right which is really the last it's it's that moment to moment between are you going to actually act on that suicidal ideation or will there be someone there to help talk you off the proverbial ledge? Um, if, if that's the approach and it so often is, and I've seen people uh, at high levels within the VA patting themselves on the back for just having a 24 uh, seven helpline when really, as you, as you've just perfectly pointed out, that's, that's the last resort measure, right? really they should be thinking outside the box and working with organizations like yours to be able to uh, create that, help create that sense of community, support that sense of community, even before people get out, uh, help create those opportunities and those avenues that provide that sense of purpose. Because I know for people I've known personally and others who I've heard about, often, as you said, it's, it's, it's feeling like you're alone. You've lost that sense of community. And you go from working on an environment where literally every day of your life in some way, shape or form is purpose driven, right? You, you are getting up and you're doing, you know, turning the wrenches on the Humvee, or you're getting up and going and running around in the, the jungle out here in Schofield barracks, miserable, dirty, hungry, but you're with your buddies and you know that all of you together are working towards this same higher purpose of service service to our country and, and our fellow Americans. It's probably not something you think about every day, but deep down inside, this is why you join. This is why you do this every day for a living, because you could do a lot of other things um, that, that may not require that sacrifice. And so preemptively recognizing that, and these things get lip service. I mean, these are not novel ideas we're talking about, but the gap in the delta between understanding truly how to help people continue to be motivated with that sense of purpose um, and, and actually executing is, is that is the gap that organizations like yours are filling. And, and, you know, 
without getting too down into the deep hole of like big government bureaucracy and all that's wrong with it. But really it is that rigidity of the bureaucracy and an organization that ultimately, um, that ultimately through their actions, we see that they are, they are prioritizing feeding the bureaucracy over actually you know, flexing and molding and, and being able to look and, and come up with really creative ideas on how to best serve veterans. Yeah. Uh, and, and so, you know, okay, good, easy for me to say, but this is where, again, there, there are through lines here connected to, it, it matters who we vote for for office. It matters the kind of people that they select, for example, to run the VA. Uh, it matters who you vote for for Congress because there's a lot of resistance um, to cutting that red tape within the VA, as an example, but across federal agencies by people who are more interested in protecting union rules than they are about making sure that we have public servants in these positions who care more for their customer, their end user, their client, the American people, than they do about um, this, this kind of inward looking uh, self-protection. Well, I got to save this job and that job and that job and not as like, are they actually doing a good job? Right. Are they actually providing a quality service to people, whether it be veterans or, you know, someone walking into the DMV? <laughs> the, the, the lack of actual uh, matching how our taxpayers' are, dollars are being spent, the quality of the service that's being provided, and the metrics of success, these are the kinds of things that we should demand our leaders uh, to change and, and to address. I think so. And I think, you know, for us, we always say that it's important that we include more veteran voices in these yes. conversations and not just from the, you know, not just as elected officials, but just in the conversation. Yeah. Right? And so um, giving them this platform, you know, one of our flagship programs at Travis Manion Foundation is called Character Does Matter. So we actually train veterans to go out and deliver character education mm. to our youth. And wow. so for them, the, you know, for us, the program was created to give veterans purpose, to bring them back to that community, to put them into the community and show that they are civic assets. But the offset is we've had half a million kids who have gone through a program being taught what it means to live a life of service by veterans. So, you know, we're having secondary success with, with that in itself. And, you know, we can see no better way for veterans to thrive than by coming home and sharing their stories and not saying, I'm, I'm trying to indoctrinate you to join the military, but more so to say, hey, I served my country in this way. But yeah. you can all be servant leaders in your own backyards, like you said, in in a plethora of different ways. But yeah. kids understanding that as a young age, at a young age is so vital and important, and it's something that's largely been stripped away from our education system um, in in the recent years. You know, yeah, and, and we're seeing the ramifications of that in very far reaching ways, and and that's where. When we see the headlines, we hear from leaders in the Pentagon saying, gosh, you know, we can't figure out why no one wants to join the military these days. There's just a bunch of fat kids and they <laughs> don't care. And, and yet they just, it seems like they're just throwing up their hands and, and not actually having the kinds of conversations that we're having and recognizing the problems that, that you found is that when, why, why would a young person who has not been exposed to someone who has made that decision to serve the military before. Less than 1% of the population serves in the military. So that number of people who don't have that connection is continuing to grow. If right. they're not being taught basic civics or about the constitution, about the full history of our country and what we stand for, the pillars of, of what it means to be an American, maybe they're not even saying the Pledge of Allegiance anymore in school. Why would they be drawn to this call to serve? If Why would they be drawn to serve in a military where they may have to risk their life if they don't really even know what they are sacrificing for or what 
what makes this country um, as unique and great as it is. Yeah, and you know, we recognized in the last few years the and and we've had conversations in DC about you know the recruitment crisis and what and and really if you look at, like you said at the our past history, people joined the military because they had models in front of them, be it their parents or their siblings. Like my brother was a Marine because my dad was a Marine and my dad was a Marine because my grandfather served in World War II with the Army Air Corps. Like that's, you know, and so um, as that goes further and further away, like we have to put relevant and relatable models in front of kids. And it's not an indoctrination, but they need to understand. They need yeah. to see this this person from my community left high school and maybe went right into the Army or the Marine Corps, or they went to college and then then went to into a service branch. But they need to see these examples and hear these stories because if they're not hearing these stories, it doesn't make sense to them. It's not right. even an option that's put on the table for them. And so, um, you know, it's a, I'll say it's a, a third effect of the work that we're doing at the Travis Manion Foundation, but um, but something that we recognize is very important. Um, and I think, again, I think having people, and especially for you, you know, being a veteran, but being a female veteran. Um, and so we, we do a lot of recruitment within our program to find female veterans because I love the idea. And I always say, you know, my daughter was driven to go to the Naval Academy, not because of her uncle, um, who was a combat Marine, but because of other young women that I've had the opportunity to get to know. And mm. she saw them herself in their shoes. Wow. And, she, you know, she would watch these young girls and say, oh, wow, wait, mom, they're a Marine. I'm like, yeah, she's a Marine. And she was like, <laughs> oh, wow. You know, and so I started getting her on Zoom calls with young girls that had attended the, the academy. And and all of a sudden it started to click for her. And she's like, wait, wait, I could I could see myself doing this. And, you know, so you need to make sure that we're we're putting these people in front of our next generation. It's just yeah. so vitally important. Yeah. Yeah in this very influence heavy environment that yeah. we live in. <laughs> well, and it's so funny, Tulsi, because um there's a couple there's a couple young women and they're awesome. They're, you know, in their early 20s um and they have large social media platforms. Um one of them's in the navy, one of them's uh, a marine. Um and they're 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 TikTok and Instagram influencers. I mean, they are and, um, you know, not endorsed by the DOD that says that yep. clearly in their bio, yep. but they show themselves in uniform one day and the next day they show themselves in a cute dress out, mm -hmm. like having fun. And, you know, I, I love what they're putting out there because mm -hmm. I think it takes away kind of the stigma of, for, for young women, at least it takes away the stigma of, you know, that the military, it, the rigidness and that, that you can't live a life outside of that and right. be fulfilled outside of that and continue to have the same passions and hobbies that you do, you know? And yeah. so I'm always like, if I see one of these young women, I'm, I'll, I'll like share it with my daughter. I'll be like, oh, check out this girl, you know? So um, what, is, what does your daughter want to do? Does she want to be a Marine? She does want to be a Marine. Yes. Okay. Um. So she wants to, uh, but she's thinking like, public affairs officer, you know, right. um, and I am as a mother, I say, I love yeah. that idea. Yeah. I like that idea. <laughs> Great public <laughs> affairs officer, but you know, she's got four years ahead of her and they're going to introduce yeah. her to every single opportunity within the Navy and Marine Corps. And so yeah. who knows what path she takes right now. She comes from a pretty heavy Marine Corps family. So we'll yeah. see, but maybe she ends up in the fleet. Who knows it as a swell. Um, yeah. great. A couple quick questions before we go. Um, yeah. If you could recommend any book uh, for our audience to read, one book that has influenced Ooh. you. Um, it's hard to pick just one. Uh, I'll tell you the one that I have been, uh, that, that's a little bit off maybe the, the beaten path, but I know okay. you're, you are friends with and supported by our mutual friend, Jocko Willink. And uh, the book is called Musashi. And it's a long book. Um, it is it is fiction, but it is based on uh, some very fundamental. Um, 
I, I would say it's kind of the Japanese samurai version of stoicism mm -hmm. in a way. Okay. But it tells the story of this young boy who faces great adversity and uh, is confronted with battle and massacre and lost in his community from a very young age and goes throughout his life pursuing the, the warrior path and, and has to constantly make decisions about whether or not he's willing to sacrifice his own selfish desires uh, to serve um, to serve the well-being of his community. This answer to call to serve in his life was the path of, of the warrior. Uh, it's, it's a long book. I listened to it on, on audiobook. I, I do it while I'm working out or cooking or, you know, stuck on airplanes or whatever. Uh, but it's a it's a really powerful book that has a lot of very applicable lessons as we look in our own lives about the necessity of discipline. It's all the things we've been talking about, living a disciplined life yeah. with intention, uh, how you react to some of the most horrific things that may be occurring to you or around you and really how the choices that you make um you know you, you are you are in control of, of one thing and that is your free will and the decisions that you make and how you react to these different situations and uh, i i love i love it it's not one that is often in the top 10 or 20 or 50 list of, of leadership books i like this I, a lot of times i get kind of the you know yeah by Angela exactly. Duckworth, like right. Extreme Ownership by Jocko and Leif, you know, it's, I love this. Great books. They're yeah. great books. They are great but books. This one, this one just, you know, and I, and I thought of this because we're talking about influence. Yeah. And we're talking about both the positive and negative influences in our society today. And, uh, you know, one of the most powerful ways to convey a message or to teach a, le a lesson is through the telling of stories. And, uh, and, and this book does a phenomenal job uh, and it's applicable to men and women and people of all ages. I love it. I'm going to read it. And um, okay, so about your new book. Yes, regardless I, I was of, just thinking like, oh, my publisher's probably going to watch and be like, why didn't you say your book? Well, you know, so we're going to talk about <laughs> no, I know, I know. your new book. Regardless of political affiliation, what is something that we can all learn or take away from from your new book yeah um thank you first of all uh this 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 book really is something that i hope conveys to people um the importance of the importance of understanding who we are mm -hmm. as individuals as people in a spiritual sense and as americans and understanding what is at stake, what we cherish or proclaim to cherish and value in this country and how those fundamental uh, God-given rights and freedoms are under assault. This is not a time to throw up our hands or put our head in the sand and think, oh gosh, you know, we are, we are beyond redemption. There, there are changes that are being made that are irreparable. And let me just go and focus on my little piece of of earth, my family, my home, my job, my kids' education, and I just, I'm gonna tune everything else out. Yeah. We can't, we cannot afford to do that because inaction will result in us losing this country that we love, all of us as Americans. And so there's a clear call to action uh, that I open and, and close the book with that really I hope serves as a reminder to the individual challenge, opportunity, and responsibility that we have as Americans to take action to save our country and to defend our freedom. I love that so much. I'm so excited to read it. And my last question that I will ask you, I ask everybody, what does living a resilient life look like for you? In order to live a resilient life, uh, it's important for us to like I, I think about uh, the importance of uh, spiritual, physical, and mental well-being. Uh, that life is short, as you know, probably more than many. Our time can come at any moment. And every day that we wake up with breath in our bodies is a blessing. And living a resilient life requires us to remember that blessing, to practice gratitude, and no matter what kind of adversity you may face, 
resilience is remaining spiritually grounded and focused on um, how you can turn that adversity into something positive, whether it be for yourself or your family or, uh, or, or from the, the greater sense of the word to, to, those, um, to those around you. It's our choice. I love that you brought the, the spiritual component into it. I don't think in our 80 plus guests that we've had, nobody's brought the, the spiritual component into what living a resilient life lives. So I love that. Tulsi, your new book, for Thank love you. of country. I'm going to hold it up here. For yes. love of country. It's available now on Amazon and uh, on TulsiGabbard.com. You can order a signed copy with a with a discount. But appreciate um, you so much, Ryan. Uh, thank you for having me here to be able to talk to you, not just about the book, but about the work that you're doing and, and how we all have a part to play uh, in this service to our men and women in uniform, our brothers and sisters, our families and our country. Tulsi, thank you. Thank you for your service in uniform and your continued service out of it. For love of country, you can order it. We'll have the link on our YouTube channel and um, you can get it uh, on Amazon and TulsiGabbert.com. Thank you so much. Thank you. Great to see you.